thank you for inviting me to speak in front of this audience. It's a great pleasure for me. Um, yeah, how successful a precision experiment is, um, is a combination of how unstable and perturbing um, the conditions of your experiment are and um, how well you can characterize these perturba um, perturbations and also how sensitive your um, systems which you want to measure are to these perturbations and to what you ever want to measure. And um, in this talk, I hope that I can convince you that um, the use of highly charged ions in an optical atomic clock are a very good choice for this um, with view on um, applications like searching for physics beyond the standard model and testing fundamental physics. And this experiment was um, set up in a close collaboration between the group of Pete Schmidt of the Quest Institute of the Physikalisch Technische Bundesanstalt and the group of Rossi Crespo of the Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics. Yeah, highly charged ions are naturally observed in the corona of the sun at a temperature of 1 million kelvins, which is high enough to produce such highly charged ions. And then we use um, instruments called a coronagraph in order to um, split the lines, which we can see. And many of those belong to highly charged ions. And one of these is, um, belongs to argon 13 plus at 441 nanometer, about which I will present a measurement here. Um, we didn't do this in the, in the corona because it's a very perturbing environment. We did this in an optical atomic clock. Boron, uh, Argon 13 plus is a boron-like system. It has an electron configuration, 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. It has um, yeah, the electronic structure of boron, but um, in boron-like argon, the energy le uh, levels are shifted to a much higher energy. And therefore, it is a fine structure transition and, and run one fine structure transition, which becomes optical at 441 nanometer. A few um, words about um, properties of highly charged ions. Um, here, it's helpful to think in the concept of isoelectronic sequences. This means we have a fixed electronic structure and we add protons in order to obtain high charge states. Um, and thereby, we tune the interaction between the nucleus and the electrons. The cross structure scales with set to the power of two, and this um, quickly shifts your E1 transitions into the um, X ray regime. The fine structure and the hyperfine structure scale with set to the power of four and set to the power of three. And this um, shifts your um, fine structure transitions and the hyperfine structure transitions into the optical regime. And then there's also another type of optical transitions, so called level crossings, um, which appear at specific charge states where involved. Um, electronic orbitals become or come close enough together. And also these transitions have been experimentally already observed here in, in an electron beam ion trap. Um, and also QED effects scale with high powers of set. Additionally, highly charged ions are quite insensitive to um, and robust against uh, external perturbations. Um, many of the shifts and um, the uncertainties, uh, which are uh, produced by these perturbations scaled down with a high power in set. And um, such perturbations limit the most accurate instruments which have been built so far, namely optical atomic clocks, which nowadays operate at an uncertainty level of one times 10 to the minus 18. And in summary, highly charged ions are therefore um, promising systems to um, do a precision measure measurement at higher sensitivity and at uh, high accuracy. Up to recently, the most accurate optical spectroscopy of highly charged ions were done in electron beam ion traps on a hot plasma. Then you put a grating spectrometer in front of it. You observe lines at a large Zeeman shift and uh, a large Doppler broadening with a full width half maximum line width on the order of 50 gigahertz. But in contrast, the most accurate optical spectroscopy is done in single ion optical clocks where an uncertainty level of 10 to the minus 18 is achieved, many orders of magnitude better than uh, it is, was possible with highly charged ions. Here you can find a single ion in the harmonic potential of a pole trap. You use an ultra-stable laser to probe the clock transition. The laser is linked to a frequency comp in order to determine the transition frequency. And you have a fast E1 transition, which provides uh, um, Doppler cooling and detection. You simply um, apply the electron shaving technique. This means um, when the 
when the clock transition is excited, you shine in the Doppler cooling laser and just check if the if the iron is dark or dark than it would be here or still bright, and then you can yeah with this you achieve a very high detection efficiency. And now we also want to um, apply such a technique for highly charged ions. And the problem is that highly charged ions do not offer these fast E1 transitions, but the solution is to use quantum logic spectroscopy. And for this, you uh, need to prepare a cold two ion crystal composed of your highly charged ion, which has the clock transition here, and a second ion, which serves as a logic ion with a long lived qubit transition and a fast E1 transition. Both ions are again um, confined in the harmonic potential of a pole trap. They um, repel each other, and th therefore they um, um, move together in a coupled motion. You have six normal modes, and one of these modes is used as a transfer bus. And here we have to consider that each electronic level splits up in a ladder of motional states, and we only use for this protocol the ground state and the first excited motional state. The protocol starts by shining in the ultra-stable laser. It brings your highly charged ion into a superposition of being either excited or not. Then you shine in a red siphon pulse, and this maps this electronic excitation onto the common motion of both ions. You continue with another red siphon pulse, but now with a different laser system, and it maps the motional excitation onto the qubit. And then you can shine in the Doppler cooling laser to detect if barium plus is dark or still bright. And um, you have mapped basically one to one the excitation, the first excitation of the argon siphon plus now onto the barium plus ion. All right, how does the experimental implementation work? Here is an overview slide of our um, highly charged ion lab at the Quest Institute of PTB. We produce the highly charged ions with an electron beam ion trap. The spectroscopy is performed in a cryogenic pole trap, which is coupled to a, a home-built closed cycle cryostat, which provides a temperature of 4 Kelvin in order to um, ensure long storage times of the highly charged ions. And then we have a beam line in order to transfer, um, um, select the ions, so transfer the highly charged ions, select the ion species, manipulate also the uh, velocity distribution, and finally inject them into the pole trap. This works as follows. This is the electron beam ion trap. The highly charged ions are produced by electron impact ionization. Then a charge state distribution forms. We um, pulse up the central potential, axial potential, and then the different ion species gain a different velocity according to their Q over M uh, ratio. They separate along their time of flight, and then we can use a high voltage electrode here in order to select the species in which we are interested. The ion bunch arrives at a um, pair of pulse drift tubes. Here we will perform a first deceleration step. We have a potential hill here. The ions have to climb up. We pulse the potential down, and then they have already lost a considerable amount of their kinetic energy. The pole trap is again is also biased. There they lose the, their residual kinetic energy. They are just able to enter the um, or overcome the entrance um, barrier at the pole trap. We have already loaded laser-cooled crystal of beryllium plus ions. When the highly charged ion is inside, we um, switch up the entrance barrier. The highly charged ion moves for forward and backward, uh, interacts with the laser-cooled beryllium plus ions, and finally it co-crystallizes a technique which we have already shown in the predecessor experiment at MPIK. And then we heat out the excess beryllium plus ions, thereby reduce the size of the Coulomb crystal, and finally we end up with the two ion crystal, the argon cyton plus here and the beryllium plus here. And this crystal is already quite cold because it's laser cooled. Now we have to do the ground state cooling. We have chosen the, the out of phase axial mode as a transfer mode. And in fact, we have to cool both axial modes uh, to the ground state in order to prevent the dephasing of an initial thermal Fox state distribution in the other mode. Here, a uh, first order axial siphon spectrum is shown of the qubit transition, we have blue sidebands and red sidebands of both modes here. The sideband asymmetry already indicates that you are close to the Doppler limit. And now we apply a technique which is called resolved sideband cooling. We shine in a red sideband pulse on the qubit transition, followed by a dissipative step with the repumper laser. And thereby, we can climb down this ladder here 
and we arrive at the quantum mechanical constant of motion. This is what you can then measure by taking another sideband spectrum. The red sidebands have vanished here because there is no further transition. We can measure with sideband thermometry the mean occupation numbers. And um, when we did this for the first time, um, we yeah, have produced the coldest side charge ions of all time with a temperature of about 20 or less than 20 microkelvin per ground state cooled mode. The next step is the electronic state preparation of the highly charged ions, or more precisely, um, the preparation of the correct Siemens substate. So the excited state splits up into four Siemens sublevels, the ground state into two. And now, by applying again a sequence of red and blue um, sideband pulses, we can um, prepare in a unidirectional and deterministic um, um, way the left ground state, as is shown here, each side and pulse is followed by ground state cooling. And if you want to um, prepare the other ground state, you would just flip the sequence here. Yeah, with um, all these um, tools at hand, we could demonstrate quantum logic spectroscopy of a, high, of a highly charged ion. And with this, the first coherent laser spectroscopy of, an, of a highly charged ion, we can um, determine, we can. Um, coherently um, transfer population from the ground state into the excited state and back and forth and back and forth, a feature which is known as Rabi oscillations. The coherence is limited here by the excited state lifetime, which is 10 milliseconds. We can scan our clock laser across the resonance with longer probe times. We observe full width of maximum line width on the order of 50 hertz, um, which is already quite close to the natural line width of 17 hertz. And this number has to be compared with what was possible in electron beam ion traps, which was 50 gigahertz. So this is nine, order, uh, yeah, nine orders of magnitude narrower here. Um, then I already, already said this, the transition splits up in six Siemens components here. Um, obvious quantities you can now look at are the um, ground state and the excited state G factor. Um, and this impressively um, emphasizes how sensitive um, highly charged ions are to fundamental physics. We have now zoomed out by a factor of 10, and the measured Siemens components are colored here. And now in black, the prediction by non relativistic theory is shown, and we are 50 and 30 line width apart. Now you can use um, um, relativistic theory, and we are still many line widths apart from what we observe. When you now um, include inter electronic interaction effects, it gets even worse. And only when you also include the QD contribution, you can properly predict the line positions. And with our current uncertainty level, and if we would zoom in, we would be even able to resolve the nuclear contribution here. Yeah, now we had the fortunate case that the ground state G factor was already measured to high precision in, in a pending trap experiment. This one we could use to calibrate our magnetic field. We could reconstruct our excited state here and then derive the excited state G factor for the first time with an uncertainty which is compatible with the most advanced um, theoretical prediction. These are our measurements here. And we could even uh, resolve uh, or settle a discrepancy which was present in the uh, uh, calculations here. And we can also um, measure the excited state lifetime in a completely different environment as it was possible before in electron rebuying traps because here we have uh, more or less an isolated uh, highly charged ion in a pole trap. We just have to introduce the wait time in our quantum logic sequence. And then we, we measure the excitation probability as a function of this wait time and ended up with uh, about 10 milliseconds, which is uh, yeah, compatible with uh, the electron beam ion trap measurements and also with the theory. But if you have a closer look on these numbers here, there is a five sigma discrepancy between the experiments and the theory. And yeah, by Im improving this method, taking more statistics, one can also try to, to, to settle this discrepancy here. Yeah, um, this was the first part of my talk. Um, we improved considerably the um, uncertainty level of what was possible before. In electron beam ion traps, one was limited to something like a little bit better than 10 to the minus six. Then there was a panning trap measurement where for the first time single, Highly charged ions were measured, but with our coherent method, we could significantly uh, improve on this. And in the second part, I will now uh, um, yeah, talk how we um, upgraded the experiment to an optical atomic clock. 
um, important um, step was the implementation of algorithmic pooling um, to cope with our um, Q over M ratio mismatch between the highly charged ion and the logic ion. This, we go in the radial plane for this. We have two strongly um, coupled radial, most strongly coupled in the sense of uh, to the, our um, Doppler cooling laser. These are not a problem because we can cool them, but then there are also two weakly coupled radial modes. And here the beryllium plus ion does not, or almost does not move. We um, can hardly cool them with our Doppler cooling laser, but the highly charged ion is moving a lot. And this can cause a second order Doppler shift, which can be considerable when the, when the mode is hot. And the idea here is to coherently transfer phonons from the radial mode in the axial mode from which we can efficiently cool them. And it is done as it is shown here. We shine in with our, with our clock laser um, uh, red sideband pulse with respect to the radial mode. Then we excite the highly charged ion. We have removed the phonon from the radial mode. And then we uh, continue with another red sideband pulse, but now with respect to the axial mode and store this phonon basically there. And then we can do what we have done already before the resolved uh, resolve sideband cooling. We repeat this and we can also we then end up um, in the quantum mechanical ground state of motion also in the radial mode. And this is what we can measure again by taking a sideband spectrum. Um, and with this, we achieved a new temperature record because now also these weakly coupled radial modes have a temperature below 200 microkelvin. And we can also stay in close to this ground state by just regularly applying um, algorithmic cooling cycles during our frequency measurement. And this technique in principle enables um, 10 to the minus 18 uncertainty levels. Now we want to do um, clock operation. This means we want to continuously measure the unperturbed transition frequency. This is done by stabilizing our clock laser to four of the six uh, Zeeman components, which are shown here. We run individual servo loops here. We measure the excitation probability of the half maxima points. And from a difference in the excitation probability, you can then calculate an error signal and use it to steer your clock laser uh, to the Zeeman component again. And um, here is the Allen deviation, which quantifies the stability of your measurement. Um, in black, it is shown the average of the four Zeeman components. And this average nicely um, yeah, averages down. And it has another advantage that averaging over the Zeeman components eliminates the linear Zeeman shift and also the electric quadrupole shift. Yeah, with this, we could, or we have done recently the first clock comparison, and this is quite a team effort. We have on the left side here our highly charged ion clock, on the right side, the terbium plus clock of PTB, we compare to the, to the octopole transition here. And yeah, this was an in-house measurement, basically, um, owing to the yeah, excellent infra meteorological infrastructure of PTB. Both clocks are linked to their um, respective frequency comms. The frequency comms are stabilized by an ultra-stable laser, which is again stabilized to a cryogenic silicon cavity. And with this, we could um, perform this frequency ratio measurement. We um, achieved a frequency stability of three times 10 to the minus 14 per root tau, basically limited by the excited state lifetime of argon 13 plus. We ended up with a statistical uncertainty of one times 10 to the minus 16. This large number here gives you the ratio between both frequencies. And since the, the absolute transition frequency of terbium plus is known, we can also derive the absolute transition frequency of argon 13 plus with an uncertainty of 110 millihertz, which corresponds to 1.6 times 10 to the minus 16. And yeah, we are limited by our statistical uncertainty here, but also, so to say, by the definition of the SI second, because um, um, you cannot realize the SI second considerably better than 10 to the minus 16. Yeah, a few slides, one slide um, about the systematic shifts. Our um, leading contribution comes from micro motion due to a misalignment of our trap electrodes. Um, this is not a fundamentally limiting thing for us because um, you would need a better trap. <laughs> and this is underway. This is just trap fabrication. 
the next um, contribution is um, a probe laser induced shift, which is in our case not an AC Stark shift, but an AC Siemens shift. Yeah, again, no fundamental limitation here. Um, the first order Doppler shift is eliminated by counter propagating clock beams. The linear Siemens shift is eliminated by averaging over the um, multiple Siemens components here. The quadratic Siemens shift is extremely small for highly charged ions. Theory can calculate this. The electric quadrupole shift is also eliminated by averaging over the Siemen components. And the second order Doppler shift is under control with the algorithmic cooling here. And um, we ended up with a total systematic uncertainty of 2.2 times 10 to the minus 17, which is almost one order of magnitude below our statistical uncertainty. And by this, we have shown that um, you can measure um, optical frequencies in highly charged ions with an uncertainty of um, level of 10 to the minus 18 by just getting rid of this large number here. Yeah, <clears throat> so we could um, thereby improve on our previous uncertainty um, significantly again. We um, improved the transition, absolute transition frequency of argon 13 plus by eight orders of magnitude. We also measured the isotope shift between argon 40 and argon 36 and improved this number by nine orders of magnitude. Yeah, and then this uh, was basically this, the second part in the third talk, I, part of my talk, I would like to address some applications for the search of um, new physics beyond the standard model, the search for dark matter and fundamental constants. After we have this technology now, um, it was mentioned and discussed in a few other uh, talks, 25% of our universe consists out of dark matter. Now we can assume a tiny non-gravitational coupling between normal matter and dark matter. And in a simple scenario, the Earth would move through such a um, dark matter distribution. And this would cause the energy levels of the normal matter atoms to vary with time. And it could be interpreted as a variation of the fine structure constant alpha. How sensitive? A specific atomic system to this effect is, is given by this equation here. And this sensitivity factor K is on the order of one for neutral or singly charged atoms. And then there are sensitive and not so sensitive systems. And in clock comparisons, we can um, yeah, put an upper bound on such a time variation. And here, highly charged ions offer the potential to significantly improve on this because their sensitivity factor is can be up to one or two orders of magnitude higher. And of course, you have to do this in an optical atomic clock. The second application deals with uh, the search for fifth forces and isotope shift spectroscopy. The isotope shift can be expressed as the sum of the field shift term and the mass shift term. And now you can take two transitions of maybe two different atomic systems, but with the same nuclei to eliminate, eliminate the um, charge ready here. And then you can plot the isotope shifts against each other, more precisely the modified isotope shifts. And then isotope pairs, not isotope, yeah, isotope pairs should line up on this straight line here within the standard model framework. If we assume a hypothetical fifth force between um, electrons and neutrons, which we would describe by Yukawa type potential mediated um, by a particle with the mass phi here, we would get an additional term in the isotope shift here, which would introduce a nonlinearity in this King plot. And highly charged ions offer here also um, additional um, options. An interesting species are um, carbon-like calcium, but also boron-like calcium. These uh, transitions were recently measured uh, by our, our collaboration here in an electron beam ion trip trap, electron beam ion trap to an uncertainty level, which is sufficient that you can continue with uh, quantum logic spectroscopy here. And we also discussed in this um, publication here that it can be beneficial to combine in a king plot transitions with very different electronic character, namely uh, P2P transitions from highly charged ions and S to D transition from the calcium plus then. We, um, estimated a yeah, hypothetical exclusion plot, what, what we could achieve here. And now also the experts might know that or will know that um, there are 
higher order standard model terms, which can also introduce uh, nonlinearity into the King plot. And here, um, uh, generalized King plot method analysis was suggested in this publication, which needs additional transitions in, which you can use to eliminate these higher order effects. And these additional transitions can be found, for instance, in highly charged ions because you just have a larger number of um, systems which you can use here, which gives you additional access to uh, clock transitions. Yeah, with this, I'm at the end in short summary and outlook. Um, the first optical clock based on highly charged ion is in operation. Highly charged ions are simple systems with several properties to test fundamental physics and search for new physics. Quantum logic um, gives us access to a multitude of atomic and nuclear properties. And the technique is universal. We are not limited to a specific highly charged ion species. We have improved the level of uncertainty of HCI optical spectroscopy. And now with this technology, um, we can do next generation timekeeping basically and search for dark matter, variations of fundamental constants and fifth forces. With this, thank you very much. But most of all, many thanks to all the people who have contributed to this project. Okay, Thomas, thanks very much for the very nice talk. Peter. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, I, mean, I always wondered actually, how, how do you quantify the nonlinearity in this, in this King's plot? You know, it's like, I mean, it's experimental data. It's never on a straight line, right? Because you have experimental errors. I think there are, I mean, this is not what we did so far, but I think that as far as I know, there are different ways how to, um, I mean, you can, um, I, I mean, you can go this way or this way or this way to just. Um, Naively, I would think that I, well, I just fit the parabola to this and, uh, and then see if the, if the quadratic term vanishes. But now I have three points and, you know, with three points, I can always fit the parabola exactly. Yeah. So how do you quantify the nonlinearity? Mm. Ima has a comment on this. Basically, you can calculate the, the area uh, of, of the triangle and uh, with, with error bars propagate the errors and see. And that's uh, one of the characteristics, for example, the simplest one. Okay, then Christoph has a question. Yes, so you have shown the result of the uh, argon 13 fine structure, which is about 15 digits accurate. Um. I go back to this number. The same? Yes, it is, maybe it is not 15. I didn't count it. It should be 1 times 1 1.6 times 10 to the minus 16. Uh, <laughs> 10 to the minus? 10 to the minus 16. 60. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, but the five electron system, it is still a calculable system. So you don't need to do a king plot. You can calculate. Uh, let me. <laughs> <laughs> so. Because the fine structure is very sensitive to alpha. So why, why we cannot determine alpha from this transition? Oh, we would need uh, calculations. No, I, no, mean. No. I know it's not a question <laughs> to you, it's to all the audience. <laughs> because the, since the five it means the fine structure is not very much sensitive to nu nuclear size because uh, it's also a fine structure. It is, but barely sensitive. So I would say maybe it's possible because 16 digits is already for alpha, it would be great. So uh, because I, I previously attempted to determine alpha from the helium phi structure, but uh, but, the, but this is from two electrons. But a, one, so I would say it is not impossible to do the accurate calculation for the five electron systems. But it's, so uh, just the idea that one can, with this precision level, one can think about the determination of uh, alpha. And also for the isotope shift, you don't, you don't need to do the king plot for argon 13 because it's a calculable. We can, if you calculate, if you perform the measurements, we can get the charge radius, but maybe not for fine structure. I mean, argon cannot be used for the king plot because you don't have enough stable isotopes. You would need at least four to generate three points in the king plot. And how many isotopes argon has? Yeah, do you have? I mean, we have measured two. There's in principle a third one which you can could measure, but uh, 
then you have to go to okay but i'm not personally not interested in king cloud i would be much more interested to get the alpha if it is possible if, if we can be calculated hey, paul I think the problem is that you you cannot use uh, to that accuracy. You need to calculate all your QD correction to all orders and exact, exactly to, to get to it. So that's, that, I mean, you have to go to third order and everything. And the, even, the, even the, lamp, the, the self energy, I mean, you have to, so it, now it's known with uh, all the digits you need, but the next order is you have only part of this. So that would be key. You, uh, Who knows with six? Not with that many digits, I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> Any other question at the moment? In case not, I have one very quick one. Peter, what's the K factor of argon fourteen plus? Well, I don't know. I mean, for the for alpha for, for the alpha variation, because I don't, you, I don't know. And I mean, typically you are. For, I mean, for the, to look for variation of the fine structure constant, we typically um, are looking to um, level crossing transitions, yes. which have these high sensitivity factors. Um, I have not seen that anyone has calculated this for categorization. Here's a question. Um, I noticed that your um, shift from the clock laser was some 2 10 to the minus 18. Which seemed a bit surprising to me. What what shift do you mean? Uh, the clock laser Stark shift, probe laser induced shift. This is the uncertainty. This is not the shift. Uh, this. I'm wondering why the uncertainty is. How do you come to that uncertainty? Yeah, this is um, an off resonant coupling um, of our clock laser to the neighboring Zeeman components, and we just um, do a uh, um, Calibration of this you measure with at different uh, laser intensities, um, and then you do an extrapolation to zero laser intensity, and this is just an, a very conservative number which we have estimated here because on this uh, systematic uncertainty level, it's not necessary to do it uh, better when you are you have statistics which is one order of magnitude worse. Thanks very much. If we have this table on paper, <coughs> so this micro motion shift is effectively a time duration shift, right? Yeah. Uh, and could, could you give us an idea, a rather technical question, on which type of misalignment of electrodes, which order of magnitude of misalignment yeah. uh, does this correspond to? Okay, maybe I have one slide with our trap here. Yeah, for instance. So we have two blades which have the DC electrodes on it. And um, these two plates are shifted along the axial direction a little bit. And this gives you an axis axial micro motion, which should not be there in a perfect trap. And this is what gives us the, the large number. And this is not compensatable. You, you need a good trap where the DC electrodes are properly aligned and the, the axis micro motion along the radial directions, you can then compensate by compensation electrodes. This is kind of a fundamental limitation for, okay. for so the setup. How, how big is this misalignment in microns? Or I do not dare to okay. give a number okay. here. I have okay. to yes. yeah. look this up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe then no additional questions. Maybe one final comment, Peter. Did you ever consider to set based on these measurements limits on millicharge particles? We have not. So what are your heating rates for the argon ion? Um, the heating rates are on the order of uh, 10 quanta per second. Pretty sure at, 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 at this high charge you can set some interesting limits mm -hmm. on, on, the, on the landscape. Okay. Yeah.